Izzy said he looked and felt good. How did he look to you? He looked great. And I feel like for the City Kickboxing team, all three of them, it was very much a tale of proving taking time off can be beneficial. When you look at Israel's performance, he shouldn't be upset by any means. Like, obviously, losing sucks. It is a part of the sport, however. But during those three and a half, almost four rounds, he looked exceptional. I see it. I seen it potentially going two and two into the fifth round if we'd made it into that round. He looked great with his striking, his timing, his range. He immediately set the pace, set that early in the fight, really took it. I seen him winning that first round. He really made Drikus Duplessy adjust immediately. He showed why he's one of the best in the world. And he proved that time and time again. This sport is a game of inches and one small mistake can cost you big time. It happened this weekend for him, but I don't think by any means he looked bad at all. When it comes to Drikus Duplessy, the way that he fights is not what people quote unquote think that a fighter should look like. And I think he needs to start getting the respect that he deserves because he is unorthodox. He doesn't look technical. He looks like he's fighting for his life. He's scrambling. He's making it look ugly, but it's working for him. And he needs to garner that respect because he's not just beating these guys. He's finishing former champions like Robert Whittaker and Israel Adesanya and going to a 25 hard 25 minutes with Sean Strickland. This is a guy that he might not look technical. He might not look like the most prim and proper fighter that everyone expects to see from a champion. But the end of the day is he's finding ways to win and he's winning. Winning is all that matters in this sport. It doesn't matter how you win. doesn't matter how you get there. As long as your hand is raised at the end of the day, and that's what Drickus Duplessis is doing. It does, might not look pretty, but it's working for him, and I think he deserves the respect, and he deserves to have people stop talking like, oh, he's, he's gassed, or he's not technical, or so-and-so is going to piece him up. But he seems to find a way every single time. So I think we need to start changing this narrative because the way that we view how a fighter should look doesn't necessarily mean that it is a recipe for success. I think, you know, both you and I have spoken about this. Sean Strickland doing the UFC a favor and taking on Drikas Duplessis in his title defense so closely after beating Israel, kind of done him a service doing the UFC a favor that kind of has earned him to be in the spot where he's at. Do I think that he should be fighting for the title next? No, I don't. I would have preferred him to fight somebody else, get another win, and then get that back, because now his last fight was Drikus Duplessis. And that was almost, we're coming up in January a year ago. So I would have preferred him to stay active. Rob is on a two fight win streak, but this is how matchmaking works. It's timing, it's who's ready, who's not, who wants to fight this person, who doesn't. I think post UFC 308 and the winner of Chemayev and Rob Whitaker, depending on how impressive that performance is, I wouldn't be surprised if that winner, if it is very impressive, they jump the line and they'll book that winner versus Drikas Duplessis instead of Sean. When you look at the landscape of the flyweight division right now, I know he's got beef with Manel Cape, but He's coming off of a loss. Alex Perez coming off of a loss. You know, he could potentially do a Brandon Roy Val rematch, but he's already booked to fight. In the grand scheme of things, there's really nobody for him to fight right now unless we're getting somebody, you know, ranked 9th, 10th, 11th in the division to match him against. So where everything kind of is right now, that fight makes sense. And there's history between the two. They both fought back on the Ultimate Fighter back in 2016. He lost to Pantoja, so Kai wants that one back. And kind of the theme of Cedar Kickboxing, this time away has been great for him. So I'm really wanting to see the evolution, the next step, this laser focused, new and improved Kai Kara France 2.0, I think could potentially prove dangerous for somebody like Alexander Pantoja. So I think that will be the fight next, but obviously, it's up to the matchmakers. We can only say so much, Phil. I think he shouldn't have took this fight. That was, I've said this leading up to this fight. That was his fourth fight in a year. Three in six months. Sometimes fighters are our own worst enemy and I understand wanting to fight in front of home soil. However, we know that UFC is gonna come back to Australia. 
This wasn't the last time they were ever going to come back to Perth. We know that they were going to continue to have fights in Australia at least once, possibly twice a year. He didn't need to take this fight. He should have rested. This was too much in such a short time, amount of time span. The weight cut, the toll on the body. He needed to take a break. Unfortunately, didn't go his way. How much of that was attributed to him fighting too consistently, wasn't properly rested, or how much was that? Because Kai Kara France is really just that good. So for Steve, though, he has so much time. This is his first year in the promotion. He's only four fights in. So it'll be interesting to see how he bounces back because this is the first time he's had back-to-back -back losses in his career. I absolutely love watching Dan Hooker fight. He is your favorite fighter's favorite fighter. And every time he steps in there, it's so exciting to watch and fight of the night worthy every single time. And he looked phenomenal. He looked so poised, so controlled, but still chaotic in the way that he fights. He, he's still the Dan, just improved. When we spoke to him earlier this year, he mentioned over the last six months during this forced layoff, he has seen the most improvements in his game that he's ever seen in his entire career. He showed up and showed out this weekend. He took on Matush Gamrot, the number five ranked guy in the division who, with a win, was probably in lines for a potential title shot and beat him at his own game. He looked great. One thing with Dan is, I kind of mentioned this last week leading into this fight, was this was a make or break fight for him. This was a fight where we were going to tell if he was going to become more of a gatekeeper outside of the top 10 for these young up and comers coming through, or he was going to be able to become a legitimate threat, legitimate contender at the top of the division. He showed exactly where he's at, what he's capable of, and I'm excited to see what's next for him because he's making more smarter choices for where he is in his career right now. Well, for me, it's always every time the UFC has the opportunity to go to Australia, this is huge. It is huge for the sport in the in the market. You know, back when I first started over 10 years ago, this it was a taboo to be doing mixed martial arts and people kind of looked at you differently. So to see where it's come from to where it is now, even just from the last time the UFC came to Australia to this event, it's the growth is so exponential and the ability to showcase the Australian athletes on that level is always inspiring to see and it's inspiring the next generation which is so important for the growth of the sport in the region. So I, I just love having this, you know, the UFC be able to go back there and highlight the talented individuals that we have coming out of that region.